am Maurice Hobson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies and Historian at Georgia State University. Tonight we will have a conversation with Dr. Tiffany Player, who is an aficionado on, uh, on, on discourse that engages uh, Black women in politics. Uh, before I get into the introduction, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Department of Africana Studies. And I'd also like to thank the good people at Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American history and culture for all that they do in terms of our freedom schools. Dr. Tiffany Player is an assistant professor of history at Georgia State University. She's a historian of identity formation and the attendant political and social transformations of communities within the African diaspora during slavery and after emancipation. She completed her PhD in history from Washington University in St. Louis in 2018. Her book project, What Are We Going to Do for Ourselves? African-American Women and the Politics of Slavery from the Antebellum Era to the Great Depression, analyzes black women's efforts to force a public reckoning with the material and cultural legacies of slavery in the United States as an essential component to their political power across multiple generations. For most of you all who are paying attention, you know that over the last few years, black women have been at the center of promoting democracy in particular ways. Here in Atlanta, Georgia, we have three major players, Latasha Brown of Black Voters Matter, Nse Ufat of the New Georgia Project, and Stacey Abrams of Fair Fight. One of the things that Dr. Player is going to present to us tonight are several case studies that show the underpinnings of the traditions in which these women are working. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Tiffany Player. Thank you so much. Um, it is great to be with you this evening. And I wish to give thanks to Dr. Lakita Bonnet Bailey for the invitation, the Department of Africana Studies and the Auburn Avenue Research Library for creating this space for intellectual and community engagement and to Dr. Hobson for moderating tonight's event. I look forward to sharing a bit of my research about African-American women's activism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I am currently working on a book that examines four generations of Black women's political traditions and activities from the 1850s through the 1930s. And that 80 year period roughly spans the lifetimes of many of the survivors of slavery who were interviewed during the WPA Slave Narrative Project in the 1930s. It is also a dynamic period in which African-American women established themselves as public policy visionaries and radical curators of historical memories of slavery that they politicized in a deliberate effort to improve the material conditions of formerly enslaved people and their descendants in the United States. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. So the key, one of the key things that I'm talking about this um, evening is that Civil War emancipation really created a vibrant and vulnerable ex-slave public that helped and helped usher in a new era of African-American women's political activity focused on defining the legacy of slavery for future generations. Both ex-slave women and those who had never been enslaved publicly rejected images, ideas, and policies that ignored the violence of slavery and attacked Black women in their communities. Tonight, my presentation features two important campaigns that demonstrated how two generations of activists challenged white supremacy and created alternative expressions of Black women's potential and power. My first case study on the 1895 Negro Building highlights the efforts of Black women and men and men to demonstrate just how much the race had accomplished in the first generation after emancipation. While African-Americans had created their own commemorative calendar of emancipation celebrations and local black history and culture programs, 
The Cotton States Exposition marked the first time that African Americans were invited to participate in a major world's fair. African Americans were in charge of constructing the building, curating the exhibits, organizing events, and hosting scores of Black visitors who traveled to Atlanta. Examining the promise and the controversy surrounding the Negro building and African Americans' participation in the Cotton Exposition uncovers a dynamic group of Black Americans consumed, and I don't use that term lightly, with defining the legacies of slavery for the 20th century. I will pay particular attention to the December 1895 meeting of the National Congress of Colored Women in which primarily educated middle-class activists used the Atlanta Fair to help launch a national Black women's reform organization. Their presence at the fair and their list of demands couched, couched in aggressive critique of an unfinished emancipation process that exposed critical differences with black male leaders. They also had to contend with white Southerners who were more interested in commemorating lost cause fictions of white supremacy and black subservience. But in asserting elite black women's potential to lead the race, the National Colored Women's Congress focus on respectability and domesticity often alighted the concerns of poor ex-slave women and men who used the exposition and the Negro building to produce their own meanings of slavery. The second case study I'm going to discuss tonight focuses on African-Americans protest against the United Daughters of the Confederacy's proposal for a, ma a Mammy monument in the nation's capital in 1923. During an intensive year-long campaign, Black activists challenged white stereotypes about the meaning of Black women's labor and affection during and after slavery. And in the process, they subverted the Mammy image to intensify their demand for a federal anti-lynching law. Although the US never passed such legislation, African Americans were successful in preventing a national Mammy monument from being erected in the nation's capital. Protesters, many of whom were young and had never been enslaved, argued that African Americans possessed the only legitimate claims to the slave Mammy in defining the legacy of slavery. Before I examine these two campaigns, I'd like to begin with a brief meditation on this picture. It is one of the first pictures of formerly enslaved Black Americans in the Civil War South. This picture was taken on a cotton plantation near Buford, South Carolina, and more than 100 people appear in this 1862 photograph that captures the promise and the uncertainty of Black Southerners during this time period. The photographer, or perhaps Union Army officials, assembled the group together to document what they perceived as the moment of emancipation. As you can see here, these survivors of slavery gathered as a community, comprised of mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters, extended kin, friends, lovers, rivals. Some have bags packed and others are empty handed. The overexposure of this image highlights their liminal status in the United States in 1862. They were not yet citizens. That would come later with the passage of the 14th Amendment. Nor did they know what would happen next. But with the chaos of war and the opportunity to throw off the shackles of bondage, these Black Southerners embraced a new identity as ex-slave and set out to define what freedom should entail for African-Americans in this country. These are the people and millions like them throughout the South who form the collective ancestry of a vibrant and perpetually vulnerable ex-slave public in the mid 19th and early 20th centuries. Although the ex-slave public began with the survivors of slavery, it could expand, especially in moments of threat and crisis, 
to include their descendants, as well as any allies who wanted to redress the wrongs perpetrated against the most vulnerable members of a society. The increasing temporal distance from slavery and the diversification of Black populations by class, generation, occupation, and region exposed the challenges of reckoning with the legacy of slavery. We must remember this period and the decades that followed as ones profoundly shaped by members of the ex-slave public, even if most often they had to assert themselves from the margins of American society. My first case study focuses on the Negro building at the Atlanta World's Fair. From, seven, from September 18th to December 31st, 1895, the city of Atlanta hosted the Cotton States and International Exposition to showcase the resources of the Cotton States and to stimulate trade with the Spanish American countries. Its success rested upon rebranding the region as modern and progressive, a transformation that included defining the place of African-Americans in the region without slavery. In the 30 years since General Sherman's infamous march to the sea during the Civil War, Atlanta had transformed itself from a fledgling agrarian economy into an exemplar of post-war Southern industrial capitalism. The city's African-American population exploded after the war as ex-slaves fled plantations for better employment opportunities and to assert their new identities as American citizens. By 1895, Black Southerners made up roughly 40% of the city's 75,000 residents. The city was home to the largest concentration of institutions of higher education for African-Americans and offered grand possibilities for the new Negro. Segregation laws and racial violence, however, also define the spatial and cultural boundaries of post-emancipation life in Atlanta. By the time the Cotton States and International Exposition opened on September 18th, Georgia had already recorded the deaths of eight Black lynching victims. Now, critics of a separate building wondered aloud whether white fairgoers would permit African-Americans to be treated as American citizens at the fair. But supporters of the Negro building insisted, however, that a separate pavilion would provide the spatial integrity for displaying the racist progress and for discussing issues of special concern to African-Americans. Exhibits of Negro progress, they argued, would not be huddled in a corner or scattered as it was at previous World's Fairs, but rather would be collected in a spacious and elegant building. The exposition's official guidebook credited organizers with seizing the opportunity of a lifetime by securing $200,000 in federal funds, roughly about $6.3 million today, for the Atlanta Fair, and a portion of that money would go towards the construction of the Negro Building. An editorial featured in the Atlanta Constitution section devoted to Black community interests summed up the enormous stakes of the Negro Building. Its success is our success. Its success is the South's success. And we, being part of the South, must succeed or fail with it. Black and white boosters heavily promoted the Negro building as a signature feature of the Cotton Exposition. The Paris Exposition had its Eiffel Tower, the Chicago World's Fair had its Ferris wheel, but Atlanta had its Negro building, one observer remarked. African-Americans control over the exhibition space only heightened the stakes for showcasing what the race had achieved with but 30 years of freedom. And that was a phrase that resounded over the course of the fair. Um, those charged with curating the exhibits had to decide how to apportion the building's 25,000 square foot interior between representing the capabilities of the Negro race, a kind of progressive emancipationist vision, and showing from whence we came, kind of outlining the 
trauma and the violence and the experiences of enslaved people. And these were two competing impulses that defined African-American culture at the end of the 19th century. Devoting considerable space to showing from whence we came would have required putting the evidence of trauma and violence experienced by enslaved people and their descendants on display for public consumption. At a time when many white Americans from the North and the South publicly questioned if emancipation had been a mistake, organizers understood that the material culture inside the Negro building really needed to show African-Americans at their best as productive citizens of a modern nation. For these reasons, the Negro building did not contain bills of sale, pictures of the auction block, or antebellum era weapons used to terrorize enslaved people. In doing so, organizers pushed the violent exploitation of formerly enslaved men, women, and children to the margins of a carefully curated story of Negro progress. While the world outside of the pavilion, the city of Atlanta, the South, and many other parts of the country moved toward stricter segregation of the races in the 1890s. For 100 days in 1895, this exhibition of Black culture became one of the most integrated spaces at the Cotton States Exposition. The exhibition's chief architect designed the Negro building in the same style as other buildings at the fair, and it was built by two Black contractors. It was dubbed a National Panorama of Negro Progress and measured 112 feet wide by 260 feet long, and as I mentioned, housed 25,000 square feet of exhibits from schools, businesses, and other organizations around the country. Rounded arches over dozens of windows let in lots of natural light, and visitors could walk up a 70-foot tower located in the center of the building and stand on a platform made of Georgia pine wood to get an impressive open air view of the exposition fairgrounds. Smaller towers posted at the four corners of the building and two additional towers flanking the main entrance created an impressive structure that complemented the aesthetic of other pavilions. The Negro building's location, however, was far away from other state exhibits and the women's building. This first Museum of Black Culture and Progress was located on Jackson Street in the southeastern corner of the fairgrounds and was flanked on either side by the amusement exhibits of the Midway Heights and the Buffalo Bill Wild West Show grandstand. This dubious placement encouraged a really blurred distinction of the Negro building as both monument and novelty. As a result, the Negro building's progressive curatorial aesthetic competed with the commercial popularity of the old plantation and living slave exhibits that were on the Midway and that depicted more familiar images of black subjection on the 189 acre fairgrounds of Piedmont Park. Black leaders nevertheless framed their control of the Negro building as a boon for Black industry. They built hotels and commandeered rooming houses in close proximity to the exhibition grounds so that African-American fairgoers could patronize um, the fair and feel like they were treated with respect and dignity. The Atlanta Fair has now become synonymous or infamous, depending on your political sensibilities, with Booker T. Washington's opening day speech in which the Tuskegee Institute founder articulated a complex politics of slavery that counseled Black Southerners to exercise patience in what he called their great leap from slavery to freedom. And he encouraged them to cast down your buckets where you are. For months, the head of the Negro Board of Commissioners, a group of 12 Black leaders, all men, charged with overseeing the Negro building, had been pushing 
the white led exhibition board to have a black speaker on opening day. Having a black speaker would not only integrate a high profile event on Southern soil, but it could also affirm African Americans as co equals in the pursuit of post emancipation Southern progress and modernity. Booker T. Washington's selection as opening day speaker, right? he accepted it readily. The Negro Board of Commissioners believed that this was a huge coup to have an African-American speaker, but Washington spoke in front of a segregated audience and not inside the Negro building. His avoidance of such controversial topics as lynching and disenfranchisement garnered considerable praise from white audiences. But the vision he articulated on opening day avoided demands for political rights in favor of economic uplift. And it is important to understand that his was only one of the positions espoused by African-Americans at the Atlanta Fair. On Friday, December 27th, 1895, Margaret Murray Washington, uh, Booker T. Washington's wife, joined dozens of, quote, the best of black womanhood in Atlanta for the National Congress of Colored Women. More than 200 black women representing local clubs from 26 states in the District of Columbia came together for two days of fellowship and political conferencing and to witness the nation's first Negro building. Clad in full length dresses, perfectly coiffed hairstyles and elaborate hats, these members of the educated elite epitomized the new Negro woman and marked the first organized gathering of African-American women at a US World's Fair. Entangled with their confident diagnosis of the problems African-Americans faced in 1895, was a complex ambivalence about the legacy of slavery and a nagging uncertainty about just how ex-slaves and their poor descendants would fit into a modernizing American society. For two days, these race women outlined a bold progressive platform that supported women's suffrage and universal education, identified the key components of stable black households, denounced lynching in the convict lease system, something that Booker T. Washington didn't do in his opening day speech, and called for an end to segregation on trains and streetcars. These activists demonstrated just how far Black Americans, at least those who shared their exceptional claims to education, refinement, and money, had advanced in the 30 years since the abolition of slavery. Deploying a politics of uplift and respectability popular among the educated middle class, these participants declared that slavery had marred the Negro past, but not its future. When Margaret Murray Washington attended the National Congress of Colored Women, she really stepped out of the shadow of Tuskegee and her famous husband. The Macon Mississippi native wielded considerable influence in her own right on race and gender issues. And she promoted industrial education, domestic training and land ownership as practical solutions for African-American progress after emancipation. In her capacity as Lady Principal of Tuskegee Institute and President of the Tuskegee Women's Club, she had demonstrated a deep commitment to building stable and prosperous Black families. Living and working in rural Alabama, she organized weekly mothers' meetings and domestic training programs for freed women and young girls on the Russell Plantation, which was a settlement located just a few miles from Tuskegee. Her programs adhered to a Bible, broom, and, bi and bath teaching philosophy that instructed female caretakers on how to cast off the vestiges of slavery by adopting bourgeois methods of housekeeping, cooking, sewing, and childcare. Murray Washington and other elite Black women like her focused on the redemption of Black mothers 
and redeeming them from a degrading legacy of slavery and aiding them in creating stable and respectable homes. They disparaged the one room log cabin that really had provided practical and communal support for multiple generations of ex-slave families. They called those um, residences unwholesome and also detrimental to the moral and physical well-being of the masses. African Americans frequented the Cotton States Exposition and their presence as organizers and participants were important in promoting evidence of race progress. This is a picture of one of the many African American women who served as docents to answer questions about exhibits and race progress more generally. This is a particular picture of a woman who is representing Alcorn University um, who contributed that contributed items for the Mississippi exhibit. And these women right, positioned in front of these exhibits were there to embody and perform black respectability and femininity, which was a really important part of this politics of slavery um, at the 1895 World's Fair. While the Negro building marked a new level of Black participation in the United States commemorative traditions, the Midway's old plantation exhibit recreated images of Black subjugation for the comic relief of white audiences. The return of Aunt Jemima, the mammy caricature that debuted, her, that debuted selling pancakes at the Chicago World's Fair two years earlier, epitomized white Americans' rejection of the new Negro. This was particularly an affront to the Colored Women's Congress who had asserted an elevation of black womanhood beyond the slave mammy. And you can see here the plantation exhibit garnered considerable press in the Atlanta Constitution as a true symbol of black life in the South. For much of the cotton states and the international exposition, Elite Black men and women used the Negro building to control narratives about African-Americans' history of enslavement and the racist progress after emancipation. But the Negro building also provided poor ex-slaves with an opportunity to meet together and define their own legacies of slavery. A realization that age and health ailments might prevent them from gathering again likely compelled some to make the journey to Atlanta that December. The opportunity to witness the Negro building firsthand and to personally assess what the Negro had done undoubtedly held great appeal. The presence of an older generation of formerly enslaved men and women inside the Negro building imbued this monument to race progress with cultural significance beyond what new Negro men and women had intended. Ex-slaves strolled the aisles of the pavilion alongside those who, never, who would never completely understand nor fully appreciate the sacrifices that they had endured and the community ties they had forged within the crucible of human bondage. Within the walls of the Negro building, they joined a community of ex-slaves who affirmed their self-worth in a changing world. One of the many groups that encouraged members to attend the fair was the Ex-Slave Association of Atlanta. And in addition to uh, providing mutual aid support and community and organizing community fundraising drives, this group also supported the call for ex-slave pensions as a form of reparative justice. Even before the Cotton States Exposition closed on December 31st, 1895, many believed that it had done more for the Negro than anything since its emancipation. African Americans had showcased the race's achievements and made a compelling case for full participation in American society. Final tallies showed that more than 1 million visitors, black and white, men and women, middle class and poor, traveled to Atlanta and many of them toured the Negro building. 
And by that account, the Negro building was a resounding success. But the popularity of the Negro building proved no antidote to the anti-Black impulses that the Supreme Court codified in its 1896 Plessy v. Ver Ferguson decision just five months after the fair closed. African-Americans' efforts to define the legacy of slavery took on an even greater sense of urgency in this new era of separate and unequal. My second case study focuses on the 1923 protest against the National Mammy Monument. On February 28, 1923, the US Senate approved a proposal by the Jefferson Davis chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy for a monument to quote, the faithful mammies of the South, faithful colored mammies of the South. Black newspapers and civil rights organizations and the National Association of Colored Women, the organization that was founded just after the Atlanta Fair um, by many of the women who attended the Colored Women's Congress, they all launched a massive public relations campaign to quash the bill. The Mammy Monument controversy exposed deep fractures in American society regarding race, gender, historical memories of slavery, and public policy in the early 20th century. The proposed Mammy Monument was not an innocuous commemoration of a bygone era, but rather a deliberate threat to African Americans' ongoing struggle to secure equal rights in the United States. This design for the monument pictured here shows an enslaved woman holding a white child while two others vie for her attention. Her own biological children are not a part of this image of black womanhood and motherhood. In many ways, this Mammy Monument campaign was an effort to put black women back into their place by fabricating an idyllic and false rendering of interracial intimacy and was particularly important at a time when white women were struggling and many times failing to forge bonds with black women on an equal basis. White women seem to be much more comfortable with this particular image of black womanhood. Founded in 1894, the UDC led a charge by a new generation of white Southerners to rewrite the cultural memories of slavery, the Civil War and Reconstruction in the service of preserving white supremacy. The group had, elect, had erected smaller tributes to former slaves in cities and towns across the Confederacy, but the decision to push for a monument in the nation's capital heightened the cultural wars over slavery. The UDC debated for decades about erecting a Mammy, Mammy Monument and at the end of 1922, finally found support in the US Senate. At the time of the monument controversy, most African-American women labored as low-waged and overworked domestics and caregivers in white homes in the South. This is a picture of two women and their white charges in Baker County, Georgia in 1912. The accompanying caption gives the names of the two white children pictured, but does not give the names of the black women taking care of them. They are simply, simply listed as two domestic workers. Certainly civil war emancipation challenged antebellum conceptions of race, gender, and labor. And after the civil war, black domestic workers organized collectively to increase wages and secure living out privileges in a deliberate effort to carve out economic and physical autonomy as a marker of their newly emancipated status. During the 1890s, scholars have argued that a mammy craze took over white popular culture and that this obsession with mammy was born from white Southerners' anxieties about living in a society without slavery. The symbolic importance of mammy was and is in helping white Southerners and by extension white Americans construct their racial identity. In this way, mammy primarily existed to support the physical and psychic needs 
of white citizens, such that the lived experiences of the black women who actually worked in white homes were irrelevant. Hence the reference to these black caregivers as two domestics. Resting control of the slave nanny from white Americans became an important political strategy for black activists in the 1920s. Just one month before the US Senate approved the UDC's proposal to honor the faithful colored mammies of the South, Southern Democrats had filibustered the dire anti-lynching bill, a bill that would have actually prosecuted and fined those who participated in lynch mobs and the public officials and communities that aided them. These Southern Democrats kept it from coming to a vote. Black club women viewed the proposed Mamie Monument as a direct assault on respectable Black womanhood. Both Ida B. Wells, national and international anti-lynching activists, and Mary Talbert, president of the anti-lynching crusaders, a short-lived organization that formed to try to get this federal anti-lynching law passed, was, were just two influential Black women who linked the protest against the Mamie Monument with the need for a federal anti-lynching law. In an editorial in the Black Valley News, they protested, one cannot help but marvel at the desire to perpetuate in bronze or marble a figure which represents so much that really is and should be abhorrent to the womanhood of the whole civilized world. Mammy's sons and grandsons are peonized on Southern plantations, are disfranchised and are Jim Crowed on public carriers. They are maltreated, lynched, and all because they are the offspring of the black mammy. In a newspaper editorial, um, another African-American um, women, woman activist, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, lodged another complaint and urged the UDC rather than wasting funds on a granite um, structure, if the fine-spirited women of this organization are desirous of perpetuating their gratitude, we implore them to make the memorial in the form of a foundation for the education and advancement of the Negro children descendants of those faithful souls they seem anxious to honor. And so you can see here, African-American women activists really kind of trying to um, link veneration of Mammy, subverting lost cause fictions of who Mammy was, um, and kind of trying to link that with efforts to pass a federal anti-lynching law and addressing the needs of a contemporary Black population in the 1920s. The Chicago Defender called the proposed UDC monument a disgraceful statue. The director of the NAACP's District of Columbia chapter described his beloved mother as one of those unfortunates who had had the flower of her youth spent in a slave cabin. Plantation mammies existed, he admitted, but she bore the, her sufferings in patience. And the NAACP director rejected the notion that white Southerners knew the heart of a slave mother. They forget that Mammy loved her children, her black biological children, and that she labored and suffered and died in the dream that someday they would be free. The Baltimore African-American, another leading black paper, offered an alternative design for the monument. It featured an African-American woman, a recognizable Mammy figure, replete with bandana, apron, and humble clothes. Her right hand is extended for back pay due, right? In a gesture for reparative justice. And she's holding presumably a white child, but not affectionately, as in the case of the UDC monument proposal, right? But she's holding this child by the shirt and the child is facing downward. And she's standing on top of a wash tub and the engraving reads, 
In grateful memory to one, we never paid a cent of wages during a lifetime of service. And this cartoonist suggested that the statue be erected on the mall midway between the Lincoln Memorial and Washington's monument. In May 1923, an editorial published in the New York Age, another African-American newspaper, linked Mother's Day and the Black Mammy. And it praised club women and the younger generation of the race who raised a hue and a cry against the Black Mammy statue and urged them to build a monument to the real Black mother of the race. The article described Mammies as the wellspring of African-Americans and that although it may never, that we owe Black Mammies who were the mothers to us all as American citizens, right? That the race whose mothers were slaves, that they were able to reproduce is a tribute to our mothers. Right? And that the race should have made the strides in education, in the arts, in the sciences. Again, this kind of um, progressive emancipationist vision that the race's success they owe to African-American women and mothers. The Mammy Bill died in committee in the House of Representatives, thankfully. But in this particular um, kind of controversy, it's important for us to kind of take into account this is a way in which African-American activists of um, across generations, um, men and women are embracing and kind of trying to redefine the history of the Mammy in a way that they really did not do at the 1895 World's Fair. And so we can see in that 30 year interim, um, a difference in terms of the ways in which African-Americans are kind of trying to evoke the historical and imagined experiences of enslaved women to kind of try to advance um, contemporary public policy. These two campaigns, the Negro building and the Mammy Monument controversy took place as the population of those who had survived slavery aged. This picture taken in 1916 in Washington, DC, just a few years before the Mammy Monument controversy shows some of the, shows three of the eldest attendees of a slave reunion. Lewis Martin, aged 100, Martha Elizabeth Banks, aged 104, and Amy Ware, aged 103, attended this gathering organized by a local church. They came together to share their experiences and to discuss important issues. Although there's no official record of the proceedings, these elderly men and women rejected efforts to obscure their presence in American society. They remain the elders of an expanding ex-slave public that now encompass younger generations of Black Americans and their allies who had never been enslaved, but who nevertheless were committed to addressing the needs and concerns of those most vulnerable in American society. African-American women were instrumental in defining the legacy of slavery and trying to control the representation of enslaved people as the basis for meaningful reform in the United States. This last image of a rally poster created by New York City's Domestic Workers United chapter highlights the continued efforts by African-American women to control the legacy of slavery. This late 20th and 21st century extension of the ex-slave public is animated by those interested in articulating and protecting the needs of the most vulnerable members in our society. Thank you. First and foremost, Dr. Player, what a wonderful presentation. Um, it is clear that the winds of change are blowing and that your research will be at the center of something that is groundbreaking, particularly the further development of African-American women's history. Um, I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to, someone just wrote in the, the, uh, the, the chat, you know, thank you for your research. Um, I want to pose the first question and hopefully this will start some other questions. And so I'll open this up for questions. And, and uh, this question that I'm about to ask is, is it's one that I have to really kind of think about in terms of what's going on, but based on your research, and in discussing the trends and tensions around black women's imagery spanning from 1850s to the 1930s. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a wide, a, a vast uh, periodization. What black women do you believe should be memorialized in terms of public memory to represent all of the tarrying that black women have endured? And you, I'm giving you an opportunity to give me your Mount Rushmore of black women who should be memorialized during that period. <laughs> oh, wow. Um... That's a great, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, of course, Ida B. Wells um, stands out as, as key in part because she was, because of her anti-lynching work, but also because of her kind of unapologetic embrace of the issues that um, the most vulnerable members of American society were facing. Um, one person that I would also want to kind of include is um, the venerable Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, um, who was an activist who was a Baltimore native, had never been enslaved, um, was active in the antebellum era, and but really kind of learned a lot and realized that she could learn a lot from people who had been enslaved. And one of the things that's really interesting about Harper, who's kind of like my spirit guide through this project, is, you know, she had never, she was born free, but she understood that her identity and Black women's politics needed to go through the experiences of enslaved women. Right. And so she toured the Reconstruction South um, and lived and worked with formerly enslaved women as they were kind of trying to define um, what freedom would mean for them. And they and she also was a foremother of the Black Women's Club movement. And so she was in attendance in Atlanta in 1895 as um, a foremother of you know, kind of 20th century Black women's activism. And so her kind of, um, her work is really inspirational to me um, because she understood kind of what was at, at stake. Um, Mary McClaw Bethune, of course, um, she is kind of like the, um, the, you know, daughter of, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, kind of the political daughter of her. I mean, she was a part of Roosevelt's, President Roosevelt's Negro cabinet in the 1930s and was really instrumental in kind of trying to identify the needs of African-American children. Um, she was the founder of Historically Black College and University. Um, and so, you know, she would be absolutely, you know, kind of right up there. Um, one of the things that I kind of struggle with, and it, it's much easier to kind of identify women who have left some cache of papers or were profiled um, fairly regularly in the historical record, like Harper, like Wells, like um, Bethune-Cookman, but I'd also want to kind of include, you know, and maybe kind of go try to honor the charge that the, you know, some of the protesters during the Mamie Monument controversy um, were saying is like, let's kind of venerate African-American mothers, right? So how do we kind of depict that? Um, so that we, I mean, there are lots of women who do not appear in the historical record um, regularly or only do so intermittently. How can we um, kind of honor their contributions to African-American progress. And so I would want to kind of figure out how to do that, um, to answer that charge from the 1920s. So that's just kind of off the top of my head, some of the people that I would um, want from that time period that I'm studying. Can I ask just a really quick follow-up? It's a two-part question, and then I promise you I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> 
I um <clears throat> so to, the two part question is I, I've been thinking about this. I mean, Stephanie Shaw's "What a Woman Ought to Be Into Do" and uh, Treva Lindsay's book on Black Club Women. I mean, you know, there's there, there are numerous. Uh, it's it's a hot topic in in a particular kind of way. Uh, Tara, Tara Hunter's "To Joy My Freedom," which is set in Atlanta, which deals with working class, you know, washing women. But the first part of the question is, you do an excellent job of presenting how race women, how black elite middle class race women, are organizing politically. But uh, and considering the state of affairs in 1895 with state constitutions, with anti-black uh, policies, I'd like to know, uh, did these women engage um, working class and poor women uh, in the same regard because of the nature of sexism, of racism, of the American South, of segregation? And um, so that's one part of it. The second part, well, you can go ahead and answer that and then I'll ask the second part and then, then I'll be quiet. So. <laughs> No, no worries. Um, I mean, one of the challenges that I am kind of wrestling with in this project is to not let elite women, elite Black women, you know, well-educated, um, well-resourced, relatively speaking, um, kind of dominate the narrative. Um, it's really important to me to kind of get at some of these intra-racial tensions um, and one of the chapters that I'm working on um, that really kind of highlights the ways in which working class Black women are kind of pushing elite Black women in really uncomfortable ways is with, re with regards to the reparations debate and the ex slave pension movement. And so Callie House, I uh, would want to put her on that Mount Rushmore um, you know, kind of homage um, that you mentioned, that you asked about earlier. And, you know, she was, um, had been born enslaved and was real and was a washerwoman and was really um, kind of instrumental in kind of building a national profile for this call for reparative justice at the end of the 19th um, century and the beginning of the 20th century. And that created a lot of tensions among African-Americans about what is the proper cause, um, what are the causes that African-Americans need to be focused on? Should they be focused on the future or um, redressing the wrongs of the past? And so I'm gonna be using a lot of WPA narratives to kind of try to present um, or engage this counter archive of the records that were produced by elite Black women so that we can kind of understand the tension that um, is taking place. This is a really diverse Black public culture, Black women's public culture during this time period. And so I'm interested in kind of trying to delve into some of those complexities. Um, for Many of the elite Black women, they were interested in, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, kind of rehabilitating, redeeming working class Black women. And sometimes that really didn't go over very well, um, in part because a lot of working class Black women are, were already kind of articulating the ways in which their lives would be better served. Like they might've been interested in, in garnering some of the resources that these elite black women were interested in, you know, kind of dispensing, but that they weren't ready to concede complete control over their lives or the direction of black politics from these women who um, had, more, um, had more status and more, um, more education and resources than they did. So yes, that's absolutely something that I'm really attentive to and wanna make sure that that kind of comes through in the manuscript. Well, the second part of the question, I mean, you, you, you did a really nice segue. Um, I can't help but think of Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's uh, Politics of Respectability from her book, Righteous Discontent, that really did kind of push the push, push the ball down the field in terms of African American women's history. Mm -hmm. And so several years ago, so, well, let me say this. Today, this notion of the politics of respectability is almost, a uh, Black respectability is almost used in a negative kind of light. Uh, right now, there is all kind of tension going on uh, around Alpha Kappa Alpha and the use of Alpha Kappa Alpha on the TV show Insecure. And people are saying, well, you know, these talented 10th Black people think that they know what's best for, and it's like, whatever. You know, you, you get into these conversations, but Several years ago, 
Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham had a conversation with Keisha Blaine. And she talks about how society, particularly young black folks, had hijacked her term of the politics of black respectability. Mm -hmm. And she said when she created the term or, you know, thought through the term, it was really about black women who had taken back their dignity and made black men respect them because black women were putting the gas in the tank for the long civil rights movement for, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, can you talk about that in terms of, I mean, you just, you know, you said some of it, you said, you know, sometimes that what the black elite and black middle-class women did did not go over well because black working class and even the poor women actually knew what was good in their lives, what they needed. So they didn't need anyone to articulate or chart their path for, they just needed the resources. But can you speak to that conversation around the, the political use of the politics of black respectability versus what it was uh, initially meant to be used as in terms of some way, a, a way of presenting black women in a particularly uh, positive light? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, obviously Higginbotham's work has really influenced the way that I'm thinking about the kinds of activities that African-American women were involved in. Um, I happen to think that um, kind of expanding this out while well, putting slavery at the center of this politics really allows for working class and formerly enslaved women, most of whom remained poor throughout their lives, to have a much bigger voice in defining what African American women's um, futures could be, right? Or redressing some of the issues that they were facing in their contemporary moments. Um, certainly this is about, you know, kind of defending their womanhood. Um, I mean, I think that Deborah Gray White does that really well, um, as well as Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. But it's also about this, you know, kind of dealing with the, the Black women's relationships to Black men. I mean, there's a lot of tension during this time period, and a lot of Black women, working class and otherwise, are thinking that, you know, there's just kind of like a crisis of leadership here, um, and that African American men aren't necessarily supporting them and their vision and their kind of agenda in the way that they should. There's also an interracial dimension to this where. African American women are having to um, defend themselves in, you know, kind of the public arena in which um, most Black women are working as domestics during this time period, and so are their labor and their kind of private lives are being um, either erased or disparaged, right? And so there is an element to this respectability of trying to um, showcase um, African-American women in the best possible light, but also to, you know, in a really kind of um, bold way, and I think kind of radical way, to not say that respectability is the um, solely what elite white women can do. And so there's that element. One of the things that I'm really interested in kind of doing is um, really digging deep into the messiness of the intra-racial Black women's dynamic, where you have, you know, African-American women who are really kind of trying to from diverse backgrounds, and I'm taking diversity really widely here, you know, region, generation, um, status, you know, occupation, et cetera, like that this is a really diverse um, population and that slavery, like wrestling with that and kind of dealing with a lot of the ambivalence that African-American, that a diverse Black women's population has about what to do with the legacy of slavery. Do you embrace it? Do you distance yourself from it? Um, and all of that is tied to issues of respectability and thinking about the future and everything. But I think that focusing on this, these efforts to control the legacy of slavery is something that just kind of expands the debate even further than the politics of respectability. 
Absolutely. At this time, I would like to open the floor uh, to the audience for questions. So you can put them in the chat. Uh, okay. Well, it was somebody just really um, put something very long in here. Um, okay. All right. So I'm about to read this to you, Dr. Player. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a nice one. It says, uh, this is Rick Higgins, and it says, fascinating. I'm the, secretar the secretary of the History Council at the California African American Museum in Los Angeles. We focus primarily on West Coast issues and also consider other areas. Progress, not to, to mention avoiding retraction, is often lamentably slow. Nina Simone, everybody says, goes slow. I've lived about two miles from where Rodney King was stopped on the 118 freeway. Is there a way to bring attention to important issues and instigate real change without extreme violence? So that's the question that has been presented. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that extreme violence on the part of activists or in the context of um, responding to um, extreme violence against African American um, activists. I'm not quite sure. Can you clarify, uh, uh, Ricky? I mean, I'll just kind of start. I mean, I think that just based on my own kind of research in this in this time period, I mean, African Americans are absolutely responding to, they're responding to and kind of trying to generate um, reform efforts, but they're certainly responding to the extreme violence that they um, have experienced during the institution of slavery and beyond, right? And I think that a lot of these um, activities, right, organized by elite African American women as well as working class black women are seeking, you know, kind of peaceable solutions. Um, but those, I mean, even kind of agitating for rights um, that they believe that they deserve and do, um, that that generates some um, anti-black violence and, and backlash. Um, I think that, you know, the African-American women that I'm focused on, are really interested in kind of trying to shape public policy um, in a way that benefits the or improves the material conditions of African Americans in the United States. And so they're not necessarily interested in um, forms of extreme violence or in kind of dismantling the entire system of the United States, you know, the economic and political system of the United States, they're asking for inclusion, right, or demanding inclusion um, in these cases. And so that's kind of what, um, what I'm interested in, you know, kind of focusing on. Um, I mean, I also think that for some, you know, sometimes even just mere demanding for what for a more just and equitable society creates violence, you know, creates violent backlash such that African American women have been, you know, targeted unfairly for um, speaking their mind for trying to organize communities. They've, um, you know, had their personal lives disparaged. They've been the victims of assault. I mean, so all of that kind of violence um, absolutely surrounds those who are advocating for a just and equitable society. Sounds good. Uh, I was told that, uh... If, if you're willing, uh, audience, you can unmute yourself and ask questions if you'd like as well. Will there be another, as they say in the, the Black church, will there be another? So uh, Dr. Davis, uh, Denise Davidson, I'm sorry. Um, she's, she writes, that was a wonderful presentation. Can you talk more about how slavery and attention to former slaves shape the language and practices of the women and movements you are studying? 
Sure, um, thank you. I think for the comment and the question. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, and this is part of what I find so interesting, particularly about um, with regards to the 1895 Negro building that there was a lot of, I mean, just looking at the records, like there, the anxiety is palpable in these records where um, black leaders are debating what needs to be included inside this building. And part of it is kind of dealing with the issue of space, but also about what kind of message are people going to convey um, about African-American status in the United States um, at the end of the 19th century. And they are putting an enormous amount of pressure on themselves to kind of put their best foot forward. Um, but they also, under, I mean, but that pressure is um, not just self-imposed. I mean, there are people who are really thinking very seriously and, and wanting to kind of investigate or assess the progress that African-Americans have made um, after the Civil War. Um, and so I think that for a lot of the Black leaders who organized the Negro Building, for example, um, are a little uneasy about the presence of the really poor and marginalized ex-slaves among them, right? And so one of the um, kind of incidences, and I didn't include it in my presentation, was um, a controversy about the sale of liquor in the Negro Building. And this comes about because um, the Negro Building has a restaurant, right? And part of it is, is a function of segregation. So it's a place where African-Americans can eat, but um, it's also a really integrated space. And the sale of alcohol kind of brings with it additional monies, right? For, um, for, um, for Black entrepreneurs, but African-American women, right? Many of the them, many of the people who attended the um, Colored Women's Congress are just outraged that liquor would be served in a space that is supposed to show progress and uplift, um, you know, a break from the slavery past. Um, and that having liquor and having, you know, possibly inebriated black and white guests inside the Negro building might actually put African American women at a disadvantage. And so they talk about the sexual, ex the historic sexual exploitation of black women under the institution of slavery as a reason why black men need to actually protect their mothers and daughters and sisters and wives, right? Um, and protect them from the potential of drunk male fairgoers fair um, in this building. And so you can see, even with this just one example, the ways in which these women are kind of trying to deploy or evoke the experiences of um, enslaved women, right? and kind of trying to use that to change the policies that were um, instituted in 1895. Um, the Negro Board of Commissioners, you know, um, listened to their requests, their campaign to get rid of the sale of liquor, um, but liquor was sold during that event. Um, and there were a few um, incidences, right, of, um, kind of harassment and kind of catcalling um, inside the building. But, you know, these African-American women were interested in kind of trying to create, have this space also function in addition to, you know, a novelty for some, in addition to a monument for Negro progress, many African-American women wanted this to be a safe space for them. And they used arguments regarding the institution of slavery to kind of try to, to buttress their point. All right, at this time, I'm going to uh, allow for, uh, to Corey Thomas to speak. Um, they had their hands uh, raised. And so the floor is yours uh, to Corey. 
Okay, can you hear me, Dr. Hobson? Yes. Okay, got it. So again, um, thank you for your research, ma'am. My question is um, basically throughout your search through history to find voices um, in the community that have like displayed leadership and authenticity, and you can kind of name some earlier. Um, I kind of want to know like a contemporary organization um, of women that you feel have reacted to social backlash and begin to organize um, following a decision like Placey versus Ferguson because there's been a lot of decisions we've had um, the past couple of years um, and really speak on like how has resource mobilization kind of helped progress them. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, Professor Hobson mentioned that a couple of, of um, women in organizations um, it, as part of his introduction and I would just kind of echo that. I mean, I think, you know, the, the possibility or the reality that African American women um, have a larger platform to kind of organize, right, and to um, kind of mobilize resources, I think, is um, certainly a testament to this kind of long tradition of African American um, women's activism. I mean, I think that the um, United Domestic um, workers union that I mentioned at the end of my presentation is still very active. Um, they are um, organized by black and brown women um, who are these, you know, people who are kind of trying to um, talk about the dignity of labor, right? And who are trying to, um, they've organized and created a domestic workers bill of rights that Kind of outlines very specifically what they believe um, what they believe domestic workers should have access to, and that includes like healthcare, that includes um, vacation time, that includes an eight-hour workday. I mean, which is just kind of unheard of for a lot of women in these positions, and the fact that they are. Really, I mean, in the 21st century, really kind of try, try articulating some of the same issues that um, women who were profiled in Tara Hunter's book um, that looked at African American women workers after the Civil War, I mean, they're talking about some of the same things. And so we can see kind of a distressing continuity of African American women's. Um, like the problems that they're facing, but we can also see, you know, like a change in the kind of platform that women have. Um, and they have been, you know, kind of instrumental in kind of moving the needle a bit in terms of um, kind of mobilizing some um, resources and kind of expanding the platform that they have uh, for their message. Does that answer your question to Corey? Let, let me unmute to <laughs> All right, there you go to did, did that answer you? <laughs> yeah, he said yes. Okay. Yes, that, that, um, that definitely helped. My, my big thing was, of course, like I said, I just really wanted to get that um, name in the organization because when we're pushing the politics of respectability amongst women, I just wanted to see kind of your opinion on how it's a framework, you know, like I said, stay continuous, but change over the given of, you know, technology and, you know, of course, different spaces to organize in and people being able to kind of move freely as they want now, um, because, you know, have women that come from New York and bring their ideas to Georgia. So that mm -hmm. was my, the roof, my question, but you did answer it for me. Yes. Great. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more very quick question uh, before we close out. Will there be another? Going once, going twice, <laughs> gone. So uh, first and foremost, uh, let's thank Dr. Player for this awesome presentation. Uh, this is Cutting Edge Scholarship. We are glad to have Dr. Player. She's This is her second year uh, at Georgia State and she's been here during the midst of a, in, the, in the midst of a pandemic. And so we can't wait for things to open all the way back up for us to show her the, the, the real Georgia State love. Um, on next week, we will have a, an excellent presentation by Dr. Oliver Green, uh, who is an associate professor of music, uh, history and ethnomusicology uh, in the School of Music. He will be doing a presentation called Race, Location and Stat Status and Context, 
the politics of black masking uh, Indian uh, music inventory uh, in New Orleans. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm, let me say that one time. The culture of the black masking Indians, the Mardi Gras Indians of New Orleans, um, you are uh, you are guaranteed to have a delightful and an engaging presentation. Again, I'd like to thank the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University, and I'd like to thank the good people at Auburn Avenue Research Library. And last but not least, we'd like to thank Dr. Tiffany Player for this awesome presentation. So thank you all. Have a great night.